This is Daybreak Asia. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. Japan, South Korea opening in a few moments. And the focus today really coming down to the moves in the bond space overnight, Heidi, because we saw that big slide coming through. Stronger data tells us the Fed really not going to be cutting any time soon. Yeah, some of that repricing and yet expectations are still for five cuts, right? Down to the timing, I guess. But uh, we're shifting from the Fed focus to the RBA focus today, of course, with that first meeting of the year. And as, as with just about everything else, it's really about uh, that signalling rather than the, de the decision itself, isn't it, Belle? Yeah, and not to mention, of course, we're, we're tracking Chinese markets, whether we can start to see any sort of reprieve from the sell-off. But uh, let's get to the open here for Japan today because we had the wages data coming out about half an hour ago. Pretty mixed signals coming through. But in aggregate here, we saw wage growth strengthening less than expected in December. It still did show some, some signs of underlying momentum. If you take a look at data that avoided sampling problems, excluding bonuses and over, overtime pay, actually we saw a bit better growth. But but still, it was undershooting what economists had been expecting at the headline level and nominal cash earnings as well rising less than expected. Not a great signal for the BOJ, of course, that wants to see sustained wage growth before shifting away from its easy policy settings. But today in the session, uh, you're seeing those yields just moving a little bit higher. Japanese yen very flat and equities just fractionally under pressure here. Let's switch now to the outlook for Korea stocks today because here in the session, it's really, again, that picture of weakness coming through. We saw U.S. stocks as well reflecting some of that pressure. So just a sort of carry across and... Uh, equity futures still a little bit in the red there you can see Korean won one to note here because we do see the currency uh, trading band that's being expanded a little bit in the session today to give more details on that when I say tra trading band I mean the trading hours a trial is taking place so the Korean won will be allowed to to trade until 2 a.m. today in a trial as I said it's all about trying to improve the market's accessibility Heidi yeah, of course, following on the back of uh, China doing something very similar, right? This is a picture on RBA Decision Day. Of course, what we're really waiting for is that 3.30 p.m. Sydney time press conference with uh, Governor Bullock expected to speak. We haven't heard from the RBA in a couple of months, and this is the first decision under this revamped uh, regime for communications from the central bank as well. And we're seeing quite a bit of downside here when it comes to trading uh, in the stock session. The ASX down by just about 1% there ahead of that RBA decision, which we are expected to be a decision to hold the key rate. Uh, lots of scrutiny over the signalling, over the rate uh, path forward, as well as the updated forecast, which today onwards we get immediately on the same day as the rate decision, rather than have to wait a few days as uh, was the previous structure. We are seeing miners and tech stocks in particular leading some of those losses. It is a broadly negative session, though, with the benchmark here declining for that second day. Just a reminder, Kiwi stocks not trading today. The market is closed for a national holiday. The Aussie dollar is actually holding unjust changed uh, even as we see the dollar touching that 12 week high on the back of that yield surge as well but broadly we are looking like some down downside elements for the Aussie going forward particularly in light of weakness uh, continuing the Chinese economy and finally just uh, taking a quick look at uh, what we're seeing across crude markets at the moment we see New York crude giving back some of those gains that we saw in the early part of the week uh, just uh, under $73 a barrel there as we see a pretty steady trading session these Middle East risks are kind of more or less being offset by the hawkish Fed comments as well. Uh, we're also seeing more uh, risks of strikes uh, from the US, of course, and regional proxies against Iran and regional proxies, I should say. So we're seeing that sort of modest move there across oil. Uh, and a quick look at Bell mentioned the move that we saw in Treasury is a big two day loss as the Fed message kind of uh, really begins to sink in there. That was uh, really the biggest two day loss in months as not just the Fed messaging, but also the ISM data, the strong eco data, reinforcing the message from Jay Powell that rate cuts are unlikely to begin potentially before May. For that 10-year, that two-day increase uh, for yields is the biggest since Ju June 2022. Well, our next guess actually says that U.S. Treasury yields, having backed up a bit, is offering more attractive entry points. It's bringing Isaac Paul, who's a global CIO and portfolio manager at Oriana Financial Services. And Isaac, you actually see uh, more opportunity within the bond space, within sovereigns, than equities anyway. 
That, that's right. And, and especially now that we've seen that back up in yields, uh, I, I think as we got to the end of 2023, that really big rally, particularly in Treasuries, perhaps just got a little bit ahead of itself and, uh, and, and yields were looking a little less attractive at those points. But now that we've seen that, that big retracement back, uh, we, we do see good opportunities there, particularly because although the Fed has pushed back pretty hard on a March rate cut or even a May rate cut, they have effectively said we're cutting rates this year and so we know the direction for yields is lower and as they as the yields back back up there's a good opportunity to get set uh participate in good income but also some upside risk if the economy does slow a bit faster than than what we're seeing at the moment Isaac, within the sort of uncertainty, you know, in, in trying to predict what the Fed or even what the RBA or any other central bank does at the moment, where do you see that the risk lying, particularly, particularly in a year where we're seeing already increased geopolitical risk and as we head into more elections, domestic political risk as well? Yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of uh, broad risks out there and geopolitics has been a big issue for the last couple of years. But right now, I think one of the, uh, the major risks markets are facing is just expectations that have increasingly built up for a perfect soft landing, this sort of story of uh, surgically precise rate cuts from the Fed, allowing not just the economy to have a soft landing, something where the economy moves back to around trend growth, really what we're seeing is pricing for a re-acceleration of growth. Uh, and, and that is not something that, that looks likely in the data, yet the data have stabilised, but, uh, but we're not really seeing that really start to pick up yet. And unless that happens, I think uh, these, these pricing for very strong equity returns could just be upset a little over the next 12 months or so. Yeah, because you are still thinking that a recession will come. So I'm interested how you're interpreting the recent data that has been uh, on the stronger side. And as well, if we do see a contraction, the magnitude that you, you would be predicting. Yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. The, the recent data have pushed back on, on a near-term recession. And, and the three or uh, well, the two economic indicators that I think are really useful are the manufacturing PMI and the, uh, the change in the unemployment rate. And, and that manufacturing PMI is back up towards 50. Uh, we really need to see that fall below 45 to confirm a recession. If we're back above 50, then, then we're seeing a little bit of uh, improvement in growth. But at the moment, it's pointing to sub-trend slowing growth. Uh, uh, so it's uh, it's a little bit both ways, and same with the unemployment rate, just stabilising. Uh, it's not giving a flashing red signal, but the trend is amber, uh, and so we're really watching that carefully. At the moment, it, it suggests that a recession would be in the second half of this year, and and as far as the depth of that, a lot of that will be determined by the Fed, just how quickly they're willing to cut, how soon they're willing to cut, and how deeply they're willing to cut as economic data perhaps soften and if they try and get ahead of the curve or uh, if, if they're forced to just cool their jets a little bit and just take these 25 basis point rate cuts, that's really going to determine how deep a recession may be. What do you think about the, the lack of market breadth that we're seeing, particularly in the US, because it just seems like the, the, the rally is once again continuing to be led by the Magnificent Seven. How much does that concern you about possibly any sort of risk around a bubble? Yeah, well, I mean, it's not even the, the full Magnificent Seven anymore that is uh, that is fully rallying. We are seeing some <laughs> real differences mm, between, yeah. between uh, these. So, uh, I, I mean, I think that is a, a real difficulty that the market's facing. If you look out at what's being priced in earnings over the next 12 months, the next 24 months, we need to see a genuine, strong re-acceleration in earnings growth. At the moment, that is absolutely not coming through from sales. It's only being supported by an expansion in margins or uh, and, and that's being helped by uh, retrenchment of jobs. So this doesn't feel like a particularly uh, positive environment for equities or one where we should expect to see breadth widening out. So that leaves the market very vulnerable at these valuations. I think it is stretched. Uh, it, it suggests that we might see leadership from two or three companies this year. But, uh, but if those other four or five in the, uh, in the Magnificent Seven don't generate the earnings that the market requires, then there could be some, uh, some punishment doled out by investors. 
On a different note, we've got the RBA decision ahead in just the next few hours, not ex expecting any sort of change in policy, but a lot of focus on the tone that is struck in that press conference. Uh, what are you expecting and also what are you expecting for the Aussie dollar reaction off the back? I think the RBA will try and be firmly neutral and data dependent here. The idea of further rate rate hikes, which was the consensus view even uh, a month or so ago, I mean, I think recent data have poured cold water on that. On, on the other hand, there's there's just no evidence that the Fed uh, that the RBA could point to to say that they need to cut rates just yet. So that, that means we're going to have, I think, a, a fairly neutral data-dependent RBA for some time, uh, and, and that will provide some challenges for the Aussie dollar. We've already seen it. And, and again, the, the real whipsaw in consensus views around the Aussie compared to last year, you know, a very weak start to the year so far. Now, from our perspective, I think uh, a, a 60 uh, cent is more likely than 70 cents in the near term. And, and that, that means you've got five or so percent that could, that could give way if, uh, if the RBA is at all uh, more dovish than the market is preparing for. All right, that was Isaac Poole, Global CIO and Portfolio Manager at Oriana Financial Services. And we're just bang on 10 minutes into the session so far. So just taking a look at some of the movers that we're tracking in the session. Uh, these are some of the cosmetic stocks here that are listed in Japan and also in Korea. Uh, the reason we're tracking these is because we had Estee Lauder results yesterday. They came in better than expected. It's also cutting up to 5% of its workforce, so a restructuring program going through. Investors really liked that restructuring program, in fact, because shares rose 12% in US trading. That's the most that we've seen since August 2019. And then separately as well, we had Blackstone considering a bid for Lositan International. Uh, that's another stock to track, but uh, which is listed in Hong Kong, actually. Off the back, we are seeing some of these cosmetic stocks gaining here. Uh, let's switch on, take a look at some of the chip makers and supplies in this region. Here we're seeing, again, some moves to the upside. This is after we had on semiconductor reporting fourth quarter results. They as well beat expectations and they gave an outlook that was seen as better than had been feared. So quite a significant one because we have seen some pretty mixed views coming through from the chip makers so far in this earnings season. But you can get a roundup of the stories you need to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Bloomberg subscribers go to DayBigo on their terminals. It's also available on mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can customise your settings so you only get news on the industries and assets assets that you care about. This is Bloomberg. taking further steps to stem the market round that's hit small cap stocks especially hard. Sources say China is tightening trading restrictions on domestic institutional investors as well as some offshore units. For more, let's bring in our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. And Steve, I mean, just after the market round that we've seen, perhaps these sorts of steps, even if piecemeal, are, are still needed. Yes, I mean, there's two. Well, there's a lot of factors at play, but the two main things that I'm looking at is obviously the national team, if you want to call it that, is probably coming in to help support. You've seen that through, with some of the northbound data flows, uh, some offshore funds coming in uh, through Hong Kong northbound, uh, boosting the CSI 300 by the close. So we've seen that, and that's essentially what the data is showing. China equity benchmarks uh, rebounding started coinciding more often with buying by offshore participants through the trading links with Hong Kong. Eight out of the last ten sessions have seen inflows uh, into the mainland shares from the northbound program. One of the, those days, the CSI 300 index saw intraday rebounds just as northbound flows started turning around. So that's not just anecdotal evidence. That is pure data-driven evidence right there that there is some sort of national team trying to prop up the A share market uh, in uh, Shanghai and Shenzhen. But the other side of the story is uh, much to 
the neglect, if you will, of the small caps. So the CSI 1000, uh, a different story than the CSI 300. Uh, bring up the chart year to date. It's down about 27% for the small cap index uh, right there. Mm. Uh, and that's also leading to a lot of the angst among retail, uh, younger, if you will, investors in Shanghai and Shenzhen who feel they've just been absolutely obliterated on the markets, uh, that it's a casino as we head into the national, uh, you know, the Lunar New Year holiday. Uh, people's paper wealth has been deteriorated. So that is something obviously the government is worried about. Let me talk about those piecemeal new efforts that we're hearing from sources are saying that the Chinese government and regulators are trying uh, to take or are taking to essentially boost sentiment, put a floor on this fall in the market and uh, perhaps lead to what a lot of people have been saying eventually is going to likely happen is going to be sort of a, a stock stabilization fund. We just don't know mm. how much that's going to be. One, one academic at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences uh, yesterday essentially said it needs to be upwards of 1.4 trillion U.S. dollars. 10, yeah, 10 billion. 10 trillion. Trillion. 10 rather, trillion yeah. yuan. All right. I keep on deflecting away from the, 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 these measures. Basically, sources are saying authorities will impose caps on some brokerages, cross-border total return swaps by clients, essentially, and about limiting a way for China-based investors to short Hong Kong stocks. So that's going that direction. Hong Kong shares down 9% so far this year, the Hang Seng Index. At the same time, some Chinese brokerages that use the channel to buy mainland shares for their offshore units have been told not to reduce their positions. Okay, so that's going this way. So again, that's trying to support the A share market. Now, also, some quant hedge funds, meanwhile, have been banned from placing sell orders completely as of yesterday, Monday, while others were barred from cutting stock positions in their leveraged market neutral funds. This is what's called a direct market access strategy. It's believed to have essentially amplified what I talked about earlier, and that's the selling off of these uh, small cap stocks. Mm -hmm. Our Chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Engel there as we uh, count down to the start of trading in uh, Chinese markets. But here in Australia, the Reserve Bank widely expected to hold rates at that 12-year high and maintain a hawkish stance against still elevated inflation. In the first decision under the new communications regime, let's bring in our economics reporter Swati Pandey for more. So what are we expecting? Certainly uh, a little bit more scope for volatility. Yes, so we actually had a last week fourth quarter inflation report which came in weaker than expected and that really sparked a rally in bonds and drove market uh, sentiment towards uh, but kind of like pricing in rate cuts already. Uh, the RBA is not going to do that. Uh, they are. They still have a tightening bias until December when we last heard from them. So the big question is whether they retain that tightening bias or whether they soften it, make it more neutral. Uh, so that's what investors are going to be really looking out for. What about the expectations for rate cuts, though? Uh, do you expect to see Governor Bullock taking a leaf out of the Fed's playbook and then pushing back against those, those rate cut bets? Um, so, um, like I mentioned with the inflation report, uh, we did see market pricing change towards rate cuts. But again, Australia is expected to be the last of the dollar block countries to begin cutting interest rates. And that is because uh, at 4.3%, 4.2%, inflation is still well above the RBA's 2 to 3% target. Um, Australia was also lagging its counterparts in the rate hike cycle. So the Fed, um, the the gap between the Fed and the RBA's rate cut is about uh, rate hike is about one percentage points. Uh, so that's how slow the RBA went. Uh, also, Australia's productivity is amongst the weakest in the developed world. Productivity growth, uh, and that is another reason why inflation is expected to remain elevated in the country. So all that points to the fact that it it, it might be too early for the RBA to start talking about rate cuts yet. The RBA putting in place some of the recommendations that came from the independent review. We know the communications, more of it, uh, as well as more, you know, the fact that we get the uh, updated forecast immediately as opposed to waiting a few days. There's a lot of information to take in at once. Yes, it's going to be quite muddied. At 2.30, we are going to see a whole bunch of headlines, uh, right from the rate decision to their forecasts for inflation, GDP, employment, forward guidance. So, yes, there, there is definitely a lot. And 
And, and like I mentioned earlier, we've not heard from the RBA in two months. Uh, so there is a lot of anticipation around how their thinking has changed since the start of the year. And uh, the statement is going to be signed off by the board and not by uh, Michelle Bullock. So there is also that probability that the statement will completely change, like they will rewrite it. Uh, so that is a possibility as well. So that add, that does add to the volatility too. Exciting times. Our economics reporter Swati Pandey here in Sydney. More to come. This is Bloomberg. Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsbee says he'd like to see more favourable US inflation data before interest rate reductions can begin. But speaking exclusively to Bloomberg, he also said he wouldn't rule out a potential cut in March. It feels like the economy's been quite strong on the growth front. You got big jobs numbers, you got big GDP numbers better than expected. But at the same time, we've had inflation better than expected, too. If you look over the last seven months, we've had seven months of really quite good inflation reports right around or even below the Fed's target. So if we just keep getting more data like what we have gotten, we're well on the, uh, I believe that we should be well be on the path to normalization. Well, I understand you don't want to tie yourself down, but is there really much of a chance of a March move? The markets think now 18 percent, and some people think that's even high. Well, look, Michael, as I say, all, all we need to do is keep getting information like what we've been getting for the last seven months, where inflation on a flow basis is absolutely under control and is is in the range of, of our Fed target. Uh, and if we keep getting strong quantity numbers, that is to say jobs numbers, GDP numbers, growth numbers, while inflation goes down, in the conventional view, that's not really supposed to happen. So that would, we'd have to be entertaining the possibility that we're entering a period like the mid to late 90s where you had productivity growth faster than, than expected, faster than trend, and, th and that opens up some new possibilities. Scott Pelley of CBS last night said that Powell suggested that rate cuts would likely be a quarter, maybe a half of a percentage point at a time. That doesn't appear in the transcript. Was a half percentage point cut discussed at the meeting? Um, as you know, we, we don't report on what's discussed at the meeting until the transcript comes out. The, the, our standard way to think of it from the FOMC is somewhat like what's in the summary of, of economic projections, the SEP, which comes out every quarter. And the last time that came out in December, you saw that the median member of the FOMC thought there would be three rate cuts, i.e. 75 basis points for the year 2024. Is there a situation other than perhaps a recession or some sort of market failure where you would consider a 50 basis point cut? Well, look, I, I just think we, you get the data and, and you respond to the data uh, uh, in its totality. So uh, it's, I, I don't think it makes sense to speculate about hypotheticals of what would happen to make the rate cuts be different than what they have been in the past. That was the Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsbee speaking exclusively to Bloomberg's Mike McKee. And let's uh, turn to some political stories we're tracking today. Israel's foreign minister says time is running out to find a diplomatic solution to the presence of Hezbollah fighters along its border with Lebanon. Israeli forces have exchanged fire with the militant group almost every day since the Hamas attack of October 7. Israel has said it's prepared to open another war front if Hezbollah doesn't retreat from the border under the, long, under the terms of a long-standing UN resolution. 
Donald Trump and House Republican leaders have slammed a bipartisan Senate deal to impose new U.S. border restrictions and unlock billions of dollars in Ukraine aid. Trump used a social media post to call it a death wish for the Republican Party. Speaker Mike Johnson says the Senate compromise is dead on arrival in the House. The deal to crack down on illegal border crossings also includes $60 billion for Ukraine. We'll have plenty more ahead on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. Take a look at how we're faring as uh, we are just about half an hour into the side of trading in uh, Tokyo and in Seoul. It is broadly quite a tepid day across Asian markets. And of course, it comes as we are headed into that RBA decision as well. Before that, we are getting retail sales numbers out of Australia. The retail sales, excluding ex uh, the impact of inflation, quarter on quarter for the fourth quarter, uh, coming in at 0.3%, uh, I should say. And that is uh, higher than expectations of just a tenth of 1% and also extending gains from two-tenths of a percent in the previous quarter. Um, this, as we see, sort of a mixed picture when it comes to, of course, the uh, broader economic outlook, but certainly a three-tenths of one percent gain, considering the four fourth quarter really held that uh, critical holiday and festive period, perhaps not too much of an impressive beat there. Uh, and, of course, heading into the RBA decision, not expecting any change when it comes to rates to stay on hold, but all focus will be on uh, Governor Bullock's press conference at 3.30, those upgraded, uh, the updated forecasts, which come immediately now, uh, rather than a few days after the decision. Uh, and of course, just any signalling around whether there's a pivot, a potential sort of neutralising of that hawkish stance uh, yet to be seen. But take a look at how all of this is feeding through to how markets are trading at the moment. And of course, a big story really has been uh, the sell-off in bonds that we saw in the US, which has carried through to the Asian session, the renewed pressure that we're seeing uh, passing through from overnight. And we are seeing quite a bit of downside across the board. Uh, the broad sell-off with the Nikkei down by just about half a percent. We're also seeing some weakness when it comes to South Korean stocks as well. A lot of relief when it comes to Samsung. We'll get a bit more detail on that shortly. Uh, but also here in Australia, we're seeing a downside of about eight-tenths of a percent. Big tech, miners, some of the biggest lag laggards, but it is a pretty broad sell-off. But, Bell, uh, you know, even this good news when it comes to South Korea's biggest company, Company not lifting the broader market. Yeah, that's right. But uh, let's get more on that because Samsung's billionaire executive chair, J.Y. Lee, will continue leading the company. That's after his acquittal on stock manipulation charges. A sole court found insufficient evidence to prove that Lee misled shareholders in the merger of two Samsung units in 2015. It lifts a weight off the world's largest maker of memory chips amid a global downturn and an increasingly challenging AI market. For more on the case, let's bring in Seoul National University Professor Park Sangin and I'm curious for your views what was your initial reaction to that verdict? Well I was uh, totally shocked because I didn't expect the uh, innocent body from the judge at all because you know the uh, case is very closely related to previous uh, investments and uh, bribery case uh, uh, delivered by Co Korean Supreme Court in uh, 2017. So the Supreme Court of South Korea actually found guilty of uh, Lee for bribery and investment for illegal uh, succession using the merger between Samsung CNT and JL Industries. But uh, yesterday, the judge of the first trial uh, for this case actually uh, denied that kind of, you know, a uh, president uh, uh, judge uh, decision by the Supreme Court. It is a really shocking uh, decision making for me. Yeah, but just to, to caveat the court as well, saying that it found insufficient evidence uh, to, to prove that he misled shareholders. What do you think, though, that it, it uh, tells us about the, the influence of Chabols in, in Korea? Well, I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, after the uh, Kindle protest uh, in 2016, uh, 
I, uh, in 2015, I, uh, I, we expected something will change in Korea. The people uh, recognize that uh, corruption tie between Korean Jebel and uh, uh, politicians, ex-president Park Geun-hye, and the people asked for the change. But uh, Moon Jae-in administration uh, took the power after the candlelit protest, didn't do anything you know, substantial. And after the uh, President Yoon came to the power, actually, you know, he was ex prosecutor in charge of all this bribery and, uh, you know, accounting fraud case against the Yijeong, but he suddenly changed his attitude. He became very general friendly, and then, you know, all the social momentum and political momentum uh, faded out. Uh, at the same time, I mean, they have a heavy campaign in favor of the Korean Jebel, especially Izeo, and in the sense that uh, he is the key person for Korean economism right there. And then I mean, uh, suddenly uh, this kind of uh, verdict from the first trial of the accounting for the price manipulation in the capital market uh, just happened. So uh, it is a big swing, and it you know indicates the uh, increasing and substantial influence of Korean Jebel on legal system and politics in every aspect of the Korean uh, life uh, uh, society. Professor, obviously the acquittal, the removal of the threat of jail time comes as a huge relief for the company. Do you think it solves all of Samsung's problems? Well, not at all. Actually, I mean, the problem faced by the Samsung Electronics is that uh, the issue of whether uh, Jae Yong Lee is in uh, chairmanship position or not is more likely uh, the problem of the you know legacy strategy of the uh, Samsung uh, uh, developmental strategy from early days of the you know industrialization of South Korea. For, for, uh, to be more exactly uh, speaking, I mean Samsung is rooted in the strategy of vertical integration. And it, they believe it is a kind of uh, uh, very important source of competitiveness. But in the world of the you know open innovation uh, and the ICT innovation, uh, you know it is not the valid uh, strategy at all. So also uh, the problem of the Samsung Electronics is due to the the nature of the competition in the ICT industry itself. I mean it's more uh, so-called Schumpeterian innovation of course in the industry. So in Incumbent is in uh, the weak position uh, in the sense that uh, uh, substantial innovation may occur by the challengers. Something is now incumbent. They are in vulnerable situation. So uh, it's nothing to do with the, whether Lee Jong is in jail or he's in a uh, chairman uh, table. You say that this may, I guess, in a way reflect or, or change the political mood or the political environment. There has been some commentary that, you know, it's hard to avoid that perhaps part of the consideration was economic given the, the economic heft of Samsung, right? What, what are your views on that? Well, this kind of, uh, the kind of some misconception, uh, it was uh, as a consequence of the uh, campaign by the Samsung Jebel and the politicians and the media uh, as a whole, because I mean, there is the evidence of actually the existence of economic power in Korean society. Jebel, Korean Jebel, especially Samsung, became the de facto political power in Korean, Korean society, and they have some so huge influence on legal system, politics, and the media, etc. So the, they try to form the public opinion in favor of the uh, Samsung and Ideo. But as I mentioned, the problem uh, faced by the Samsung electronics and Korean economy in general is not about whether a person is in charge or not. It is more about you know, the fundamental change uh, we need uh, from the old regime of the developed uh, uh, you know, country uh, established in 1960s and 70s, and we have to be adopted in open innovation and the Schumpeterian style, you know, drastic innovation. So we have to have a more flexible economic system, and we have to have encourage more entry and uh, exit in the industry. The Korean job as a, a status quo it, it actually has a huge barrier to the uh, industry. And so it, 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 it goes against with the idea of the Schumpeterian uh, uh, innovation.
I wanted to move on what we're seeing with the support rate uh, for the South Korean president. There's, it's fallen to its lowest level since April. There's continued questions uh, and uproar over these questions over whether the First Lady may have inappropriately received a Dior handbag. Do you see this impacting what we see in, in the April election? Well, yes, it, it is real a big uh, uh, campaign issue. I actually, you know, uh, I, I believe, I mean, it's really uh, inappropriate for the first lady to take that expensive handbag uh, from a person who, who she claims that she's not familiar with. And uh, it, it possible, possibly it's a violation of Korean law as well. So we need some kind of a police investigation on the possibility as well. So but above all, I mean, uh, President Yoon and the First Lady had to apologize uh, for the people of Korea uh, for their uh, the First Lady's you know inappropriate uh, behavior. So uh, that is the way, uh, the way they can avoid this make of uh, campaign issue in upcoming general election. Professor, great to have you with us. Park sang professor at Seoul National University. More to come here on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. South Korean notes tied to Hong Kong stocks are facing a $7.7 .7 billion maturity wall by the end of June. And this could add to selling pressure on one of the worst performing stock markets in the world. Uh, Asia stocks reporter Jong Cheng is joining us now in Hong Kong today, not usually in Singapore. But uh, tell us, how can this become a risk for the Hong Kong stock market? So we're looking at 7.7 .7 billion. That's quite a big number for Hong Kong stocks. And that uh, represents about two thirds of the total amount of Korea yield as this maturing this year. So, and they, they're all concentrated in the first half. And the problem is when these uh, securities mature, um, the issuers will have to unwind the hedges when they, when they sold the products, as, as in they will have to sell index futures. And that's going to, of course, create selling pressure for the futures market. But that selling pressure can also you know, um, spread to the spot market as well. So, you know, that's just adding to another headwind for the Hong Kong stock market. You know, we is already facing a host of issues, you know, China's economic slowdown, US-China tensions, and this is another risk that investors will have to contend with. Mm -hmm. EIS has become a huge issue in Korea. Investors are sitting at massive potential losses. What do we know? So these uh, securities, they're sold back in 2021 at the peak of um, Hong Kong stock market. And we all know the story that follows, you know, the Hang Seng China Enterprise Index has since fallen more than 50 percent. And these, uh, these in, uh, securities are maturing this year. And that means uh, investors will be sitting at huge losses. And uh, there, there could be potential um, misconduct when the Korean banks are selling these um, securities because they're marketed as some sort of uh, fixed income um, um, sort of a product and a lot of investors not knowing the high risk nature of these products they bought into this and now they're sitting as huge losses so you know some Korean uh, regulators are already taking actions you know looking into potential uh, misconducts by banks and some banks have announced that they are stopping selling these products altogether so it has become a huge issue in Korea indeed and this also you know highlights uh, how far reached uh, the, the China stock route is it's not just limited to to China and Hong Kong only, but it's also spreading to other financial markets in the world. Our Asia Stocks reporter John Chung there with the latest. Uh, and we do have more to come here on Daybreak Asia. This is Bloomberg. Toyota is releasing its third quarter earnings later Tuesday with steady car demand and recovering supply chains expected to boost profit. For more, let's bring in transport reporter Nicholas Takahashi in Tokyo. And yeah, big earnings to watch for later today. Just talk us through the headlines of what we're expecting. 
Sure. So analysts are expecting high profits during the third quarter last year, uh, steady global demand for vehicles, as well as record-breaking sales and manufacturing on Toyota's side are looking pretty optimistic for the car maker. The main question is whether it raises this fiscal forecast of $4.5 trillion to the $4.7 trillion that analysts expect. Um, manufacturing, like I said, has been at a record high over the last calendar year. Toyota was able to uh, beat Volkswagen AG for the fourth consecutive year to become the world's top car maker. So things are looking pretty good for Toyota. The rest is whether they um, reflect that optimism in earnings later today. This even as there have been challenges, right, both when it comes to production and also some, some safety scandals? Yes, so the world's top car maker is ensnared in a pair of scandals right now, as you said. The first one emerged in December with Daihatsu, uh, which is a popular lightweight truck maker in Japan. The second one happened last month with Toyota Industries, which is a major engine supplier for Toyota. They both concern certification testing uh, standards that are sort of notorious for being strict in Japan. But these uh, misdoings trace back uh, years, if not decades, to some extent. So the big questions remain, how much is this going to cost Toyota? What will it do to reorganize its business empire? And how does it get over this and regain customer trust? Toyota is not the only Japanese automaker that's reporting over the coming days. What else are we expecting from the lineup? Well, we're expecting strong demand across the board. Japan's sales have been pretty robust uh, for most Japanese car makers, including Toyota, Honda, and Nissan. Uh, we're seeing aggressive competition in China, of course, with the shift towards EV leaving a lot of Japanese brands in the dust. BYD overtook Tesla last year, and Toyota uh, is falling further behind in that shift. Bloomberg Transport reporter Nicholas Takahashi there in Tokyo. Let's take a look at some of the other corporate stories that we're following. And shares in Palantir jumped in late trading as it reported a first annual profit. The software and analysis company also gave a better than expected outlook for 2024, citing strong demand linked to artificial intelligence, income and revenue for 2023 both beat expectations, with management saying they're rebuilding the company to meet AI demand. Bloomberg has learned that Reddit's revenue for 2023 rose 20% as it prepares for one of the most anticipated IPOs in the US. A source says it made a profit in the fourth quarter, but not across a full year. What held the social media platform is telling investors that revenue topped $800 million last year. Boeing has discovered a new problem with holes drilled into the fuselage of its 737 MAX jets. Its commercial chief, Stan Deal, says the problem originated with a supplier and will require work on about 50 undelivered 737s. Deal did not identify the contractor, but fuselage supplier Spirit Error Systems says it's aware of the issue and will conduct repairs. Blackstone is said to be considering a bid for the skincare company L'Occitane International. Sources say Blackstone is considering the possibility of teaming up with L'Occitane's billionaire chairman, Renaud Gager, on the buyout. The Hong Kong listed company has a market cap of just under $5 billion. Well, shares of On Semiconductor jumped in US trading after the chipmaker posted fourth quarter earnings and an outlook that beat expectations. The CEO, Hassan El Khoury, spoke with us about the outlook for chip demand from the automotive sector and why he's still bracing for slowing global demand. What differentiates uh, On Semi for the last, I would say, four to six quarters, we have been uh, taking, uh, taking action to match and become more in line with what we see uh, from an end demand, both in industrial and automotive. If you recall, in the third uh, quarter earnings, I started talking about uh, automotive uh, softness, inventory digestion, uh, that extended. Therefore, it was not a surprise to what we uh, announced today. It was more of a expectation and really better than expected. But nevertheless, it was a softness that we as a company have been very disciplined in addressing to get us to weather through it much better than a lot of our peers. Hassan, one criticism from Truist Securities this morning was that there wasn't anything said about 
the outlook, what happens next in those end markets. So you just said we rebalance to make sure our output match demand on industrial and automotive. But going forward, what are you hearing from those end market uh, leaders and CEOs about what they think demand for their industry will be in 24? I think uh, for us, the way uh, we're managing uh, 2024, uh, we're not managing for a uh, recovery, which if you take where we are today as a, as a base, uh, 2024 is going to be basically down in all end markets uh, versus 2023, which which was a good year in a lot of the, uh, the markets. So industrial, automotive, uh, and then the other uh, end markets will remain uh, uh, soft. If the demand picks up in the second half, that's great. That's all tailwinds for us from, uh, you know, fab utilization that impacts margin, profitability, and, and revenue. We'd rather be in this spot rather than prepare for a recovery that doesn't happen. Now you have an, a correction mid-year. We're taking, again, a much more disciplined approach, which worked very well with us for us in uh, Q4 coming into Q1. We use the case study of silicon carbide in the EV context. And Caroline quite rightly points out that we think there will be growth in 2024. It will just be slower growth, that growth is decelerating in global EV demand. Does your business reflect that? Uh, yeah, I spoke about it uh, earlier uh, today where, you know, the industry still projects a, a high number for uh, EV growth in the 30 to 40. Uh, uh, what I believe uh, based on customer engagement and really based on some of the uh, uh, leading uh, OEMs in the automotive industry, what they projected for their EV uh, uh, growth in uh, 2024, we look at it more in the 20 to 30 uh, uh, growth. That was the OnSemi CEO, Hassan Okori, speaking to us on Bloomberg Technology. And a group of stocks we've actually been tracking off the back of those earnings from On Semiconductor are the Asian chip makers and supplies here in Asia. Uh, it's a little bit mixed what we're seeing in the session so far. But as we said, that company reporting fourth quarter results that beat expectations and giving an outlook as well that was better than feared. So we saw On shares climbing significantly as did the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index. But here, uh, a little bit mixed so far what we're seeing. The other group of stocks that we're tracking in the session today are the cosmetics names in Asia and these are actually moving again mostly to the upside here. So we had uh, we had Estee Lauder putting out its earnings overnight and those actually again coming better than expected it's cutting its workforce slightly restructuring plan investors like all of these things uh, what else we're tracking it for is a story you mentioned tidy around loss of time because blackstone is said to be considering a bid for the uh, for the skincare company and of course, we're watching the RBA bill. We're just what, about two and a half hours away from the decision, three and a half hours away from that press conference under this new revamped comms regime from the RBA. We're seeing quite a bit of downside, although off session lows when it comes to trading uh, across the stock session. We are seeing tech being the biggest laggard. They're down by just about 2%. Real estate and miners and materials names also suffering quite badly, over 1% apiece there. Uh, broadly, though, we do see a bit of a bounce back when it comes to Australian bonds, potentially signalling that there are some bond traders that expect uh, possibly even a pivot-minded RBA, right? That maybe that hawkish uh, tone won't be maintained. We shall have to wait and see in the next few hours. But certainly a bit of vulnerability there for the Aussie dollar as we head into that decision, uh, particularly against the landscape of Fed Powell injecting a bit more momentum into trading in the US dollar. That's to come. That is it for Daybreak Asia. Our markets coverage continues. This is Bloomberg.